Hey YouTube, it's Evan Magician 34 and I have this week's edition of The Edge for you. Uh, sorry I've been kind of busy and my wife just uh, twisted her ankle today and there's a whole bunch of other stuff, but still, no excuse for not getting you uh, your video uh, the day it was due, so I'm sorry, but I'm making this a really interesting one to make up for it. Uh, this card, you may not even know what it does, but it's Morphing Jar number 2. Uh, and you may laugh, but by the end of this video, I think I will probably have you convinced to at least side deck it, uh, because this card really does have a much bigger impact than you would think. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a basic uh, run over of what it does. Basically, it's just a flip effect. Whenever he gets flipped, he takes every monster on the field and sends it back to the deck. Um, of course, anything that would go to the extra deck just kind of goes to the extra deck instead, and tokens just disappear. Uh, and he does it to both sides at the same time. Then he forces each player to go through their deck, revealing cards, revealing cards, revealing cards, until they hit the same number of monsters that actually went back into the deck, so not counting, uh, like, fusions, Ixies, monsters, tokens, and whatnot, but real monsters that were sent back to the deck with his effect. Uh, special summons them all face down. And anything else they pick up in the meantime just goes straight to the graveyard. Um, so it's an interesting effect. Um, what you primarily want to do with this guy, I mean, you can flip summon him during your turn to get his effect, which can be interesting and profitable, but really what we want to do is we want to set him and have your opponent attack him to flip him. Uh, not hard to trick people into doing that. Uh, it profits you a lot more uh, being set and then getting attacked into, uh, and we'll get into that. Uh, the first most important part about that, actually, is that that just pretty much stops your opponent's battle phase, because everything's now set. Uh, in face-down defense position. So obviously they're out of attackers, so their battle phase is done, which is one of the first cool effects about this guy. Um, by the way, he doesn't get sent back to the deck himself because he's already technically destroyed in battle when his effect goes off. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, so first, obviously, this guy's good because he uh, gets rid of annoying things like synchros, nixies, monsters, and fusions, and he makes all the tokens disappear, and your opponent doesn't even get a replacement monster onto the field that you have to worry about. So, I mean, that's all good. But it doesn't stop there. Let's also keep in mind that the small monsters your opponent gets are going to be set, which means they're going to be in their usually much weaker defense position than their favorable attack position. And you also know exactly what it is and where it is set on the field, which means you know exactly which monsters to attack, where, how, and with what. And anything your opponent might get, they don't get to exploit the flip effect of or any other things like that until later, like let's say Old Lone Fire Blossom. Your opponent's plant deck gets him, sets him face down. Well, they don't get to flip him, so they don't get to use his effect, which means you can attack him and kill him before he ever gets to go get your opponent a plant. And don't forget that cards that may be very limited in number are going to be getting sent to the graveyard wholesale on your opponent's side. Of course, yours too, but the point is you're going to build your deck to you know, know this kind of stuff is coming and you're less vulnerable to it, whereas your opponent's going to be a little bit better stocked with things like this. Um, all these things are going to be getting sent away, so now you can calculate how many of something your opponent has left. So it is important to know your opponent's cards, to know what they potentially have in their back rows, what they potentially have in their deck, and what you know they definitely don't. So that's another serious advantage of that. Now, let's talk about setting things up for you on your side. First of all, you can get flip monsters and whatnot that you get to quote-unquote float, because any monsters that you manage to send back to your own deck with your Morphing Jar number 2 are going to come in face down during your opponent's turn. So unlike your opponent, who can't flip his because they just got summoned, during your next turn, which will be, you know, the next turn coming, you'll be able to just flip summon the thing and get its effect, plus you'll still have the monster on the field, whereas if you'd normally set these guys, they'd probably get attacked and you wouldn't have the monster left to play with. So this can be good for, uh, oh, say, making Synchro Monsters or Ixies Monsters in addition to getting their flip effects. And let's not forget that since you have your opponent's stuff to go play around with, this plays well with cards like Horn of the Phantom Beast that like to know when things can be beaten and likes to have things in unfavorable defense positions where they're usually weaker. Also good for cards like Flamville Fire Dog. Or... Thanks to some of the new uh, Evelzar monsters, you can even go as far as to use Jurat Guaiba or Hydro Gedon. In fact, Hydro Gedon can be especially punishing as it can kill not just one, but two or even three monsters your opponent got set with Morphing Jar number two, and turn them all into monsters for you. Major card advantage gain there. Plus anything you may have stolen from your opponent by, say, getting rid of a Synchro monster or whatever. 
Another cool factor about Morphing Jar number 2 is that usually, since you're going to be getting it flipped during battle, Effect Veiler has no real use against it. And of course, Wabaku is another cool way to use Morphing Jar number 2 by flipping Wabaku, which is a pretty favorable card that can take advantage of other flip monsters too, so we may be talking flip effect monster abuse. Wabaku allows you to float them so that you can use them for sinking and tributing and whatnot later. And with Morphing Jar number 2, that means Morphing Jar number 2 is going to go back into your deck and maybe even turn into, say, another copy of himself for later use. Of course, that's all up to you. But we've been talking in abstract up until now, so let's give you uh, a few more realistic opponents, like, let's say, f agents. Well, first of all, big monsters that get hit with Morphing Jar number 2's effect don't go to the field. They get sent to the graveyard. So big bosses get sent from the deck, or sorry, get sent from the field back to the deck, and if they come back out, they just go straight to the graveyard, pretty much neutering them. And let's not forget that agents also like to rely on these guys quite a bit, and they definitely hate Morphing Jar number 2 in a few ways around him, since he doesn't say destroy. Also, while Herald of Orange Light might be the only way you can really stop Morphing Jar number 2, for the most part, at least in terms of commonly played cards, one thing that he doesn't like is if your opponent either chooses not to play him or doesn't have him in hand at the time you flip Morphing Jar number 2, this guy can easily be one of the monsters chosen for Morphing Jar number 2's effect from the deck, and he can be harmlessly set into defense mode on your opponent's side of the field, where he can't threaten your future monster effects. Of course, Dark Worlds are another deck you need to consider these days. While their splash isn't quite as big as, they might have, as we might have thought they'd be in the end, still, they're pretty significant. They love to flood the field with lots of monsters, but they don't always kill that first turn. In fact, a lot of times they come up a little bit short. Morphing Jar number 2 can be a great set into those big fields, which usually the turn after have little more they can do than just attack. And tacking into that Morphing Jar number 2 sends all this stuff back, and things like this and, say, Grapha all obviously go to the graveyard, and their effects don't get activated because they're being sent straight from the deck to the grave, so Grapha's not going to pop a card, this guy's not going to make you send anything from your hand to your bottom of your deck, this guy's not going to get specialed, stuff like that. It's always a big bonus. And another little boost about these guys, hey, no drawing there either, is of course that uh, when Grapha gets sent from the deck straight to the grave, he's not going to bomb anything, but more importantly, when he's taken from the field and put back into the deck, he's not actually going to come back and threaten you, whereas if you destroy him or tribute him off somehow or do something weird, he'll be in their grave and he'll just hop back into play next turn. With Morphing Jar number two, that's not necessarily a big concern. Worst case scenario, he goes back to the deck and then he gets milled from the deck to the grave. In which case, they still have to get a Dark World monster onto the field. And with plants, obviously one of their biggest hurts is that Synchro Ixies monsters on which they rely to really make their uh, game wins and big plays all get punished by Morphing Jar number 2, just get deleted, and they don't even get replacements. But a lot of other monsters in the deck, like, say, Reborn Tengu and Dandelion, get punished because they're nice little bonus effects which almost always go off and give them so much advantage and control of the field and the ability to produce more Synchro monsters and whatnot, their effects don't get triggered by Morphing Jar number 2, so it's a convenient little escape clause you can use to bomb out their support, and especially key cards like uh, Pot of Avarice can be good to mill with Morphing as well. So, um, there's a whole giant stack of reasons why Morphing Jar number 2 is worth at least a little bit of a try. So, I hope at least in your locals you might, uh, and this does take a little bit of a change to your average deck to really be able to profit from, but it's worth taking a look at. Um, and, as you can see, <laughs> I think if it's played correctly, played smart, and with a few, just a few tweaks, you can take Morphing Jar number 2 to some seriously big heights and even win tournaments, at least at your local level, with it. So until next time, rate, comment, subscribe, and check out my channel for more cool videos.